Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, scientists, educators, social scientists, and government leaders. Each will be one to one. I'm pleased to welcome the writer Harriet Washington to the program. Her latest book, Medical Apartheid, the Dark History of Medical Experimentation on Black Americans from Colonial Times to the Present, won the prestigious National Book Critics Circle Award. It's published in paperback by the Harlem Moon Division of Broadway Books. The title says it all, and then some. Welcome. Thank you, Sue. The reality is that African Americans are a lot sicker than whites. They have a much higher incidence of certain diseases. Uh, they die earlier. Um, you say they have a health profile resembling that of a third world country. Actually, it was Dr. Harold Freeman who made that rather prescient pronouncement almost 15 years ago when he pointed out that the men of Harlem have a health profile that resembles their people in Bangladesh really? much more closely than their Manhattan neighbors. And unfortunately, this is a pattern that we see repeated throughout the country. And your thesis is that one of the reasons for this health disparity uh, is African Americans' wariness of medical institutions and medical research based on a history of atrocious treatment by the medical establishment that goes all the way back to slavery. Let's, let's talk about what was happening uh, back in slavery. Mm -hmm. Well, I hardly know when to begin, I but, but I think the, probably the best way to put this in appropriate context mm -hmm. is to point out that medical researchers on on the whole, were not any better or worse than any other group of people. And as a result, medical research and medical care in this country has mirrored the, what's happening in the larger society. So when enslavement was the norm in the South and was legally sanctioned in this country, we also had medical enslavement. As we progressed and segregation became the norm, and segregation was the law of the land in the country, we also had medical segregation that was enforced not only by law, but by customs and by medical research and mm -hmm. medical precepts. So um, the, the medical fate of black people during enslavement was just as dire as it was in every other sphere. Um, legally invisible, separated from any um, concern for human rights. And in the medical sphere, instead of being treated as patients, as people who required care, it was the fitness of African Americans for work that was a primary concern of of medical personnel. And as a result, the health profile of African Americans suffered horribly, and their vulnerable vulnerability to abusive treatment and research burgeoned because it was sanctioned by law. Yes, you write a lot about the ways slaves were used for medical experiments. Um, our former president, Thomas Jefferson, uh, experimented with live cowpox vaccine on his slaves before using it on his family. Uh, there was one uh, example of an experiment, some doctor, I assume, uh, a pseudo-doctor, pouring boiling water on a naked slave, trying to see if that would treat uh, typhoid and pneumonia. Uh, he and was a real physician, Walter Jones. He was a real physician. And then we have the notorious Dr. Marion Sims. Tell us about his experiments. Well, Dr. Sims was not alone. What he did was actually consonant with medical practice throughout the South. But I think he is alone in the scope and in his fame, because Dr. Sims used, um, he used black people, enslaved usually, um, to perfect various treatments, which made him famous. I think probably the best example, the one that I devote the most space to, is a repair of vesicovaginal fistula, a terrible complication of childbirth during the Victorian era. Um, after the ravages of labor, usually the child would die. Um, in a woman who had vesicovaginal fistula, and she herself was left in a terrible state, um, um, incontinent of urine and feces, permanently. And so Dr. Sims understood that were he able to surgically repair this, it would make his medical fortune. 
This is a condition that affected more black women than white, not because black women were constitutionally different from white women, um, but because black women were treated so badly. Because of their poor nutrition, they had vitamin D deficiency, which led to um, skeletal um, abnormalities that made childbirth very difficult for them, um, for example. And also, young black women giving birth were y younger than white women because masters wanted their slave women to give birth early and frequently in order to increase their wealth. So Dr. Sims knew that he, if he could cure vesicle vaginal fistula, he would make his medical fortune. And over five years, using um, up to 11 women and performing 30 surgeries on one of them. Without anesthesia. Without anesthesia, he did. <clears throat> he did find a way to repair this. And after he did this, he went to Paris, where he became uh, the personal physician of Empress Eugenie, became the toast of uh, Second Empire of Paris, then went on to, right here to New York City to the Academy of Medicine. Uh, where he was hailed as a medical hero, and where he, um, from where he became the president of the American Medical Association, uh, and yet his uh, both his surgical accomplishments and his fame were predicated on the savage abuse of captive black women. And one thing I point out in my book, and that I frequently talk about, is how often this has happened with people who are taught to view as our medical heroes. And um, also, uh, I learned from your book that the cesarean section, the procedure for performing cesareans, was also perfected on female slaves. Well, yes, although that's actually um, just a little bit more nuanced. There was more there than I could really devote space to. One of the really interesting things about cesarean section, like a lot of other cures, is that black healers, um, some who were simply carrying on the African tradition of natural healing, and others who um, earned MDs. Um, typically by going to other countries, because it was difficult for a, a black person to earn an MD in this country. Um, black healers actually pioneered a lot of medical achievements that um, were not credited for. So um, black people have a very long history of successful medical research. It was Africans who first pioneered the surgical um, techniques that led to perfecting the cesarean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just as it was Africans who pioneered the use of um, citrus juice to treat scurvy and prevent scurvy, for example. You also write about um, black bodies, uh, either slaves or poor blacks. It was primarily their bodies that were used for dissections, you yes. know, for teaching, you know, the cat cadavers that were used in medical uh, schools to teach. Um, white medical students, you know, about the body. Absolutely. And that this led to widespread grave robbing. Absolutely. Um, it's important to realize <laughs> that during the, um, say, 19th century, but the 17th century as well, um, certainly it came to a head during the Victorian era, dead bodies were treated very differently by society than they are today. Uh, for, usually people died at home, not in the hospital. And when a relative died, the body was treated very reverently in a way that sort of bound its society. Images were made, daguerreotypes of the body. It was carefully bathed and clothed and dressed in funeral portraits. Uh, there was a huge market for funeral, funeral portraits. And in this essence... A portrait of the dead person. Right, of the right. dead person. Something <clears throat> that was revered, kept in the family Bible. So treatment of the dead body was very, very important to the intensely religious people of the era. And so when it came time for physicians to move from a situation where they would require maybe four bodies a year, because only the professor would dissect bodies in front of a tier of students. They were moving to a model where every student or every small group of students wanted their own body. And medical schools had to supply them. They knew that should they take them from white cemeteries, because cemeteries were segregated then, mm -hmm. that there would be huge public outcry. And in fact, right here in New York, in 1788, there was a three-day doctor's riot, because um, the whites of the city became enraged after doctors moved from taking bodies from the black Negroes' burial ground to the white cemeteries. And for three days, they were assaulting physicians in hospitals and medical schools. So they knew they couldn't use white bodies, they used black bodies. Now, what's interesting is that the, um, there has always been an oral tradition in black communities that preserved the memory of these bodies being taken. And, um, because the black cemeteries were so vulnerable, not only were they a ready source of black bodies, but people were poor, and they could not afford the techniques that whites used to preserve bodies. Whites um, would rent something called a mort safe, like a vertical cage-like array that went 
that was inserted down over the coffin and prevented someone from stealing it. But black people could not afford that. They couldn't afford guards for their cemeteries. So the medical students would come, take the bodies from the black areas, and blacks would complain about it. In New York City, when blacks actually wrote to the Common Council complaining about bodies being taken from the Negro burial ground, um, the newspaper responded, it's only the productions of Africa that are taken from the ground. Mm -hmm. So who would object? And this summed up the attitude through the country. Right, right. Um, now, current, current, there are currently presumed consent laws in about 29 states, which allow the local coroner or his representative to harvest tissues and organs for transplant and research. Uh, and that's today. So does this lead to abuses as well? Oh, certainly, certainly. Um, many of the abuses of presumed consent. Now, these presumed consent statutes, um, semantics get very tricky here, because they're often, they often are presumed consent, but they're not necessarily labeled that. However, they're all opt-out schemes in which, if you live in an area where the coroner has the right to seize the um, tissues from dead bodies, you have to be able to file an objection with the appropriate agency to make sure that the body, your body or your loved one's body won't be used that way. And yet, finding out where to go and what form to fill out can be very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. There have been journalists who have actually tried this and, you know, spent weeks just trying to find out where they should register. So the abuses have been all-encompassing, including um, scandals in which the tissues were sold at very high rates, but even when the tissues weren't illegally sold, even legal sale of the tissues is ethically problematic. You're taking tissues, including corneas and um, sometimes parts of brains from people who had died and never gave their consent, and then these tissues are being exchanged for sometimes mammoth fees for research. Mm -hmm. um, and then you add to that the fact that some people who are willing to, who might be willing to give up their tissues for research are not, necess are not necessarily willing to give up their tissues for some monetary exchange. Right. And finally, some of the, wor the worst abuses have been the ones we read about in the newspaper over the past four or five years where some of these tissues actually found their way um, illicitly and very dangerously into transplant schemes. They were never intended for transplant schemes. They weren't um, monitored and tested and typed, and they weren't safe, but they were used anyway right, because right. of the huge sums being exchanged. So it's a problem. But the um, what I call the erosion of informed consent in this country goes far beyond taking tissues when people have given their permission. Now we have approved, unfortunately, um, our government has approved the research, research on people who haven't given their consent. And, and we're going to talk about yeah. that. Uh, but right now we're going to take a break, and we'll be back with more with Harriet Washington, author of Medical Apartheid, after the following messages. Everything about buying a bigger place? Just waiting for a visit from the credit fairy. There is no credit fairy. How else will I get a better credit score? Look, you keep your credit card balances low and only open a new card if you really need it. No fairy? There's no magic to improving your credit, but there's help, and it's free. Go to creditfairy.org. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Harriet Washington, the author of Medical Apartheid. We were, before the break, we were talking about um, ways that informed consent is not honored today in terms of medical experimentation or medical whatever. T talk about that. Well, the modern wave of what I call the erosion of informed consent uh, can be traced back to 1990 when the Department of Defense asked for and received a waiver from the FDA that permitted it to subject soldiers to research without asking their permission. And it was fairly wide-ranging. There were a number of initiatives, um, including an experimental anthrax vaccine, a quite troubled vaccine, by the way. This was this was used in Desert Storm for exactly, the first time, right? Exactly. And, um, also, um, 
drugs like pyridostigmine as a possible protection against um, biological weapons. But these were drugs that were untested for these uses, and in some cases, all oh, quite risky. Now, risk is part of medical research, but in this case, um, the soldiers had never been given the chance to say yes or no. So that's when it began. In 1996, it was expanded to all Americans when a, an addendum was added to the Code of Federal Regulations, which stipulated that someone who was um, unable to give consent typically translated as um, unconscious, um, is in a life-threatening situation, and there's an experimental drug that might help them. However, um, unfortunately, that's not—that um, was actually confusing to consumers. It sounds like it's a life-giving, you know, a life-saving move, but it's not. Laws already exist that allow people to be given drugs if they can't give consent. Right. This allowed them to be given untried, untested drugs, you know, by definition risky, by definition not mm -hmm. guaranteed to work. Not just the best known therapy for exactly. that particular Exactly. Something ailment. other than the best known right. therapy, right. an unknown therapy. And today we have more and more people, corporations, private corporations, exploiting that rule to test their therapeutics, mm -hmm. uh, in my opinion, typically on populations who would not give their consent if you ask them. And does that have—is there an element of racial bias? Does this affect African Americans more than others, or— Well, is as is not unusual <laughs> in, when we're talking about medical issues in this country, there are aspects that do affect African Americans more than others. It's not a racial issue. Everybody's at risk. But, but there are some ways in which African Americans are at heightened risk. For example, um, if I look in Detroit at one particular experiment with a blood substitute, all the people in Detroit who um, suffered harm um, as a result of this research were black. And very often, if you look at the po at this communities where the research is conducted, uh, there are more c communities that are, major that are minority communities than communities that reflect the um, stats of the United States. So they tend to use heavily minority communities in some of this research. Now, in the Detroit study of uh, this blood substitute, did they know they were getting the substitute blood, and did they know what the risks were? No. These are all people who suffered trauma, who were given it while they were unconscious or otherwise unable to, to um, you know, give assent to care. So they knew nothing until after they had been given it, and they were in the hospital, sometimes days later. Only then were they told that you received this experimental therapeutic. And did, were there some deaths as a result, or, or not? There were. People did die in this trial. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, have, you also wrote about how, uh, in recent years, scientists and doctors have tested AIDS therapy on AIDS-infected orphans at the Incarnation Children's Center, which is, affected, which is affiliated with Columbia University. Right. Um, I wrote about that in 2006. The book was published in early 2007. And we didn't have all the facts then, but what I wrote still holds true. These actually were um, children who are HIV-infected. They didn't have AIDS. Okay. As it turns out, it's an important distinction, because um, if they had AIDS, then they would be frankly ill. Someone can be HIV infected and yet not show signs of illness, yet not require um, uh, therapy. They might require therapy to slow the progression of the disease, but not for any, not symptomatic therapy. So that makes a difference if you're thinking about giving someone um, medicines which are known to have serious side effects. Many medications for serious ailments like cancers and HIV and, and AIDS do carry side effects, but they're worth it because you're already in dire straits. Right. This could not be demonstrated to be the case with these children. Also, the research was begun at a time right before it was determined. We learned that children sometimes seroconvert. They can be born HIV positive, but then if they're, if they're fortunate, they will seroconvert and become HIV negative. Mm -hmm. In fact, now we know something else we didn't know then, that if you give, um, if you give mothers um, doses of uh, the proper antiretroviral regimen, then that will increase the chance of her child seroconverting. Right. Okay. But we didn't know that then. So um, although researchers didn't know it at the time, some of these children not only were only HIV positive, but were going to seroconvert mm -hmm. and then become HI negative. Right. In which case, the huge doses of medications meant for adults they were given becomes, you know, doubly troubling. Are they still doing that at that point? Oh, no, no, no. That, that research has, has ended. Okay. And the Vera Institute of Justice, um, an independent legal authority, did um, did an investigation.
you know, and they did criticize aspects of the study. You, you chronicle really an amazing history of experimentation, medical experimentation. Uh, you, know, the, you know, the Tuskegee study is the one that most people know about, right. you know, involving the, uh, uh, the black men in, in Tuskegee who had syphilis, and instead of treating them, you know, the, the investigator just watched just chronicled the progression of the uh, disease the public over, health over time. service, yes. Right. Um, but you also mentioned some others, uh, plutonium and radiation experiments after World War II, where blacks were given, routine, patients were routinely given phenomenally higher doses of x-rays than other people. And in the 1950s, when the Army and the CIA um, released four million mosquitoes per day in Florida uh, near a black housing development, what were they testing? What were they trying to test? Well, they were trying to test whether um, transmitting certain ailments by mosquito might be an effective way mm -hmm. of um, performing bioterrorism abroad. If they were um, actually, for example, just to give an example, if they were going to have um, conflict with Japan, for example, would it make sense to release mosquitoes in an area of Japan in hopes that they would uh, transmit whooping cough and other ailments? Right. So they did it with Americans. They actually transmitted um, um, pathogen-borne, um, you know, agents like mosquitoes, and then they carefully calibrated the uh, cases of whooping cough in the area to see whether they rose, and indeed they did. Wow. And, you know, a long history of uh, medical experimentation on prison inmates yes. who tend to be very disproportionately um, um, black. What has been, I mean, the medical establishment's position on, on these kinds of experiments? I mean, you know, from the, the, the AMA or the, well, I can imagine what the, the, the NMA had to say about them, but, you know, how about groups like the medical Me American Medical Association? Well, the AMA, you know, didn't take any formal stance on this that I, uh, that I know of, but individuals I know at the AMA have been largely supportive. As a matter of fact, I worked with the AMA this summer in uh, writing a history of the relationship between African-American and black physicians. And um, I got to meet some people in the ethics division of the AMA, and I found them to be very sensitive and very concerned to this history. Mm -hmm. You know, far from, and I was very happy that far from wanting to sweep anything under the rug, they seem eager to have this aired. They, they, I think they understand um, and agree with me um, that it's important to bring these horrible events to the surface, mm -hmm. discuss them, air them, and essentially acknowledge them, because otherwise, how can we move forward and ask black people to participate in medical research? And then still another area um, of abuse, I think one could call it, was the, the forcible sterilization oh. of poor women, including many African-American women, that started, I guess, back in the 30s? Back, back well, that it, far? It began before that. Really? You know, I think a lot of people don't realize that the eugenics movement that we credit um, Nazi Germany with right. is something that actually began in this country. By 1910, 1915... Which is basically, let's, let's um, try not to get the... Um, the degenerate groups, the, the lesser groups that we don't want to propagate, let's try not to get them to reproduce. Right. Right. That was called negative eugenics. You, know, you take people who you decide are not worthy of reproducing, and you keep them from reproducing, and, there, and that thereby you believe that you can improve the gene pool, therefore improving both the health and the social conditions. It's nonsense, of course, but it's a myth that many scientists clung to. And in this country, it was largely pockets of poor women, but also it was racially driven. There were huge numbers of African-American women who were sterilized without their knowledge or consent. And it didn't, although the popular term for it is Mississippi appendectomy, right. because often the women were told, you're going to have an appendectomy or your gallstone removal or some kind of innocuous abdominal surgery. And then while they were under, the surgeon would remove their uterus, remove their ovaries. So, um, but it also happened on the West Coast, it happened in Boston, it happened here in New York City. Right. Uh, it, was, it was very prevalent, and um, there were huge numbers of black women had their fertility stolen. What kinds of precautionary steps do you feel need, still need to be taken to make sure that these kinds of abuses are not 
repeat it today. The first thing in, that we have to do is roll back this erosion of informed consent. We've got to make sure informed consent is not taken off the table. People have a right to say yes or no to medical research. If you take that from people, you can never expect them to trust the system. That's the first thing that has to be done. And then the other thing we have to do is we have to, right now we have a, um, we have a different type of a double standard in which we have one standard for medical research protections in this country, but another for the third world. Poor developing countries are bearing the brunt of this history is being, is being repeated in poor developing countries, where abusive research, research um, that's um, devoid of informed consent is being carried on routinely by American and European researchers. So we have to do that. We can't maintain moral credibility without it. Mm -hmm. Also, in my opinion, right now things are set up so that there is an IRB, uh, Institutional Review Board, that is supposed to um, scrutinize and then approve only that research which is ethical and logical and safe. But IRBs have not, the 5,000 IRBs in the country, they haven't been doing a very good job. Mm -hmm. They've been letting too many um, poor re research protocols go through. Um, right now, they're only required to have one person on the IRB that's not affiliated with the, um, the, the institution. And that's a mistake, because that means that the everyday people, the lay people, who are being asked to participate, have no voice. They have no power in um, approving or unapproving studies. So I think that these boards should be cons composed of half researchers and half lay people. Okay. And there have been some researchers who uh, predictably immediately said to me, you can't do that. You can't expect lay people to understand the sophisticated, nuanced scientific arguments here. And I said, well, then, how do you propose to explain the study to them once it's approved, right. as you must do by law? Right. I'm convinced that lay people can understand this. It might take a little more time and preparation, but I, I know too many brilliant scientists who are able to explain their work right. to anybody. Right. And I'm convinced that that can be done. So we have to make lay people partners in medical research, okay. full partners, so that they have veto powers, they can raise questions that may not occur to researchers. Right, right. So that's, that's very important. And then finally, one last thing, we have to strength, we have to, um, we have to do a house cleaning at the FDA for the same reason I said before, the FDA is allowing too much abusive research to slip by. Well, it's a fascinating subject, an awful history. And uh, I think a lot of people can learn a lot about, you know, uh, our, what we've been doing in this country medically and scientifically uh, by reading your book. I want to thank Harriet Washington for joining me. Uh, medical Apartheid, The Dark History of Medical Experimentation on Black Americans from Colonial Times to the Present is published in paperback by the Harlem Moon Division of Broadway Books. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy.